In this video, we're gonna take a look at Svelkit Superforms, which is a relatively new library that makes working with forms in Svelkit so much better. But before we do, let's first take a look at how we might currently be handling forms within our Svelkit applications. And at surface level, working with forms in Svelkit is pretty straightforward, right? We define a form with HTML, and then we define some type of action on our server side that we're gonna submit the form data to, and then everything just works, right? We can then see the form data on our server side and take action based upon that data. But of course, it's not always that simple. We definitely want to validate user input. So we're going to need to define a schema using some type of schema validation library like Zod. And then inside of our action, we can try to validate the form data against that schema. And then in the event of some type of validation error, we can return fail to pass the error via the action data back to our user on the client side. And then on the client side, we can access that action data using the form prop, which we can then use to render out some error messages or change the color of our borders, depending on if there's an error with that specific input field or not. And all of this works as you might expect. But our action data structure is kind of all over the place, right? Nothing beyond my own self-control is forcing me to keep the action data consistent across all the different forms in my app, right? On top of that, adding some progressive enhancement with some client-side validation has the potential to really increase the complexity of our simple form here. So that's where Superman, I mean, Superforms comes in. So let's reinvent this setup here using Svelkit Superforms just to see how incredible this library really is. All right, so if you wanna check out this repository, it's at Cisco Heat slash Svelkit dash Superforms. And thank you to Cisco Heat here as I believe he is the primary main contributor. This package is fantastic. You're doing an amazing job. I see Joy of Code here is using it already. I should have known. But let's just take a quick brief look at the documentation. There's a lot here. There's a lot to digest and I'm not gonna be able to cover everything in this video. I just wanna kind of get you introduced so that you can go off and build great things with it and hopefully contribute to the project as well. So one of the main things that kind of can confused me at first was that it merges page data and action data consistently. So we'll take a look at this in a second, but it also uses Zod for server-side data validation, which is amazing because everybody's using Zod nowadays. It automatically courses the string data from form data into the correct types. One of the big pains of working with form data is that everything's a string, even if you define it as a number within your input itself. When it gets to the server, of course, it's submitted through the URL, so it becomes a string. Svelkit Superforms takes care of coercing that data back to the type that you intended for it to be. It has support for nested forms, as well as being able to send your forms as devalued JSON transparently and so much more. I'm not going to go into all these. It's going to take me forever, but let's just go ahead and get started. So we need to install it with PMPM and I already have Zod installed and I might already have this installed as well. But let me just go ahead and install this here. Okay, so the first thing that's kind of strange is that inside of our page.server file, we're gonna have to do something inside of the load function, right? So we're gonna define a form variable and we're gonna say await super validate, which comes from Svelkit Superforms server. It takes in, this can either be a request event, a request, form data, null or undefined in this first argument here. So we're actually gonna pass in the whole request event here. And then it also takes in a schema. So it's a Zod schema. So we'll just add our new context schema that we were using earlier, like so. And then what we'll do is we're gonna return form here. So then on the client side, we're just gonna take in the page data and then we're gonna destructure form from superform data.form. And this is going to be a store. So we can see here when I hover over this, it already has the right properties that I would expect it to have based on the schema that I defined back here. So what I can do now is I can bind the value of each of these inputs to form dot whatever. So form dot first name, last name, so on and so forth. And they also have this really cool component. It's called super debug. So what we can do here, we can just say super debug and it comes from Svelkit Superforms as well. And it wants data, it wants us to pass in the form. So if we look at the form in our web browser here, we can see that we have this new debug component. Of course, this should only be used during development, but it's pretty cool. So we can see in real time as we're typing in what is happening to our form, as well as the page status up here in the top right. So this is a really interesting feature. I thought it was pretty cool that they added this. It makes it super easy just to see what's going on as you're working with your different forms. So now let's take a look at how we can use it when we actually submit the form, right? So let's clear all of this out here. I don't want any of this, um, and I don't even want this either. Again, we're gonna set form is gonna be await, super validate. We're gonna pass in the event again, as well as our new contact schema. And then we can console log this form here. So if I open up my console and I go and submit this form, and we check out our console here, and we're gonna have a nice object that gets console logged here with a few different properties, one of which is valid, which means was the data validation successful? We have errors, which I assume will be populated whenever we have the errors. And we also have the original form data, as well as the constraints, which it received and inferred from Zod. So it's now submitted an invalid form. So I'll leave first name empty, I'll type in last name, and I'll leave company empty as well. 
So now we can see that we get valid as false. We get the errors here in a nice consistent structure. We get the data and then all the rest of the same stuff that we had mentioned earlier. So all we have to do here, which is insane to think about how much code we just had, is we say, if the form is not valid, then we're gonna return fail with the status code of 400 and we're just gonna return the form. And then even if it is valid, we're still gonna return the form. It's just not gonna be um, a failure, right? Now let's just submit an invalid form again. We're gonna see that the status code has changed in the top right to 400. And then we have our data that was returned back without having to do anything else. Now, let's say we wanna access those errors, right? Well, all we have to do is bring the errors in here. So then if we wanted to show some type of error message for each one of the individual inputs, if they have an error, we could simply do if errors, which is also a store dot first name, then we want to display the errors dot first name. And we can do the same thing for each of these inputs here, like so. And then if I come back to my browser here, we're gonna see that the error messages are now being displayed here. And of course, if I updated my Zod object with prettier error messages, those will be displayed here instead of these default Zod error messages. And so right now we're still not using JavaScript to submit this form. So we click submit. We're gonna see that the page refreshes. So how do we use the enhance action with this? Well, it's simple. All we have to do is bring in enhance here, go to our form, say use enhance, like so. And now when I submit this form, it's 100% done on the client side. You can see no browser refreshes, no navigations, nothing. And what this does is it actually unlocks a ton of additional features. And this is really where the feature list goes on and on and on and on. So if I scroll down a bit here where they talk about importing the enhance, we can see that we get additional options. So one of which is a tainted form check. So to demonstrate what this is really quick, we can bring in the object and say tainted form check or tainted message, make sure you want to leave. And then if we go into our Svelcat application, I type in some stuff, hello, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And I try to hit the back button. We're gonna see that we get this message here. And I think it really may depend on what browser you're using, what message shows up. But for some reason right now, it's not showing my custom message, it's just showing some type of default message um, here. So that's pretty cool that it does in fact pop this up though. Additionally, there's auto scroll and auto to focus on errors and a ton of other stuff as well. So the last thing I'm gonna cover in this video is client-side validation. That's been a hot topic in my comments section over the past multiple videos that I've created. And Svelkit Superforms gives you a few different options here as to how you wanna validate your client-side form. So they mentioned that there's already a browser standard for client-side form validation. You all should be familiar with this. If you're not, it's basically like, hey, when you type in a type of email and you don't actually submit an email address, it doesn't include an at dot something, then it's going to pop up that HTML message. So there's a ton of these different ones already baked in and that's where these constraints come from right so let's first take a look at the constraints which is fantastic out of the box so we can come into this destructured object here and say constraints and then we can go into each one of these inputs and just spread the constraints dot whatever the input name is so constraints dot first name and then i'll just copy this and do the same thing for each of these other inputs as well okay so i have all the constraints being spread here so now let's go into our form and let me just try to leave all of this blank and click submit we're gonna see that I'm getting the please fill out this field. Okay, I have to fill out this one as well. And if I just type in something random, not an actual email address, of course, it's gonna tell me to please include an at in the email address. Again, so this is the you know bare minimum web standard for input validation, right? But they also give us a couple other options here as well. One of which is their validator object, which if we look here, we see that we have this validators, which can either be any Zod object. So we can use Zod, it just adds on to the client side's weight, or we can use their validation syntax here. So we'll start out with their validation syntax. Let me just remove these constraints here. And then within this object here, this options object, we can set up validators and then and it's gonna be an object with the different properties of our form. So we can have first name, which takes in a first name. And what we can do is we can say first name dot length is less than one. And we want to show some type of error message. Your name is too short, otherwise null. And we can do the same thing for the rest of them as well if we wanted to. I'll just demonstrate the first name to keep things short and sweet. So then if we come into our form and I just leave that blank, and try to submit this. We're gonna get our custom message here. Your name is too short. Additionally, we could bring in our Zod schema. So you should probably put this in some type of central location if you're gonna use it in both places, but we'll just copy it over for now. And I need to import Zod here. And then instead of passing this, I can just pass in the new contact schema like so. And then now as we go to submit the form, we can start to see that these different validations are occurring just as they would if we were to submit the form all the way to our server, except it's happening on the client side, right? So I think this library is absolutely fantastic. I am super stoked to use it on my future projects. I've already started to refactor a couple of existing projects to use it uh, just because it just reduces so much code and just allows me to not have to think about how I'm structuring those action data objects. And I haven't really found the downside to it yet. So definitely go check out this library, contribute to the library, point out any bugs that you find, raise any issues for feature requests. It's 
seems like they're really looking for feedback. As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.